Good morning and welcome to Active at Home. My name is Casey. Hopefully you are comfortable wherever you are watching this morning. We have a great message for you from Pastor Mike today and some awesome worship from the team. But before we get into all that today, we have some church news that we'd like to share with you. Coming up at the end of the month on May 29th, we have Water Weekend here on campus at our 9 a.m. and 1045 service. We're going to have some water slides for the kids to enjoy. All they need to bring is their bathing suits, their towels, and some sunscreen. We're going to have so much fun. We would love to see you and your family there that weekend and we would love for you to invite a family to come with you and in june on june 14th through 16th we are doing kids blitz and our theme this year is press play and it's all about influence and how we can use our influence to build god's kingdom and how they are perfect just the way God created them to be. But more than that, we're gonna be having a ton of fun. We're gonna be having live music, games, crafts, snacks, all sorts of things are gonna be happening on campus in those three days. It's every night from 6 p.m. to 8.30 on those days. We cannot wait for it. And you can register your kids for free. Just go to the description, click that link, and you can register as many kids as you want, as long as they're in kindergarten to fifth grade. We are so excited for it and can't wait for kids blitz to happen and then in july we have something exciting that we're doing for the very first time here at active and that is our leadership summit it's going to be awesome we're going to have leaders from all over the area uh, surrounding our church and in the surrounding cities as well come to join us to hear more about leading through change and we know all about that now right maybe you're a leader and you're watching this in, in the area that you work in and you had to lead through the change of the pandemic and it was tough, right? And so we wanna to get together, uh, talk about ideas that has helped each one of our areas where we lead and we're gonna have some awesome speakers to come and encourage you in your leadership. Invite another leader to let you know, maybe they're a teacher or a manager somewhere, whoever it is, you're a leader somewhere in someone's life or in someone's company or in a business, whatever it may be, we would love to see you here. It's completely free, July 23rd. Come join us and let's learn about leadership together. Before before we get into worship today and before we get into the awesome message Pastor Mike has for us today, I would love for you to take some time to like and share this post. A share can change someone's life. And if you're watching on YouTube, we would love for you to subscribe to our channel. We're almost at 1,000 subscribers on there. So please join us on YouTube and, and subscribe there. We have some awesome content um, for you that it could be available whenever you may need it. And if you're new, we would love to know. If you're new, maybe it's the first or second time watching or you've never been active before just say i'm new in the comment section we'd love to reach out to you and connect with you in any way possible but right now we're going to go to a time of worship so after you do all that stuff get prepared get ready for some awesome worship with our team
When Tiff and I, my wife and I, when we first met, when we were dating, we introduced each other, obviously, to our families. And it was surprising how different our families actually were. Like, specifically, how different our families partied. (laughs) Because family parties, for me, were very different than family parties for Tiff. Like, family parties on my side of the family were typically 10 to 15 people. It was like immediate family. But on Tiff's side of the family, it was an invite for everybody. Like, if you had a pulse, you could come to the party. And everybody had the same first name. They were either aunt or uncle. And I realized that they weren't related by blood. It was just a respect thing. They were aunt and uncle. At my family parties, we we would laugh and we would have a good time, but I think the decibel level got to about two. But at TIFF family parties, they were at jet engine decibel level. Like they would laugh and they would sing and they would celebrate. They're Italians and so they were loud and boisterous. And at Mike family parties, we would hang for maybe like an hour and a half, maybe an hour 45 if we were pushing it. And then we would go home after that and be able to relax. But at TIFF family parties, you had to take a vacation day in order to hang out all day with the family. And that was expected of you. When Tiff and I met our families, when we got introduced to our families, it was like a culture shock. And I use that word intentionally because every family has a culture. Your family does, and my family does, and Tiff's family did, and now that Tiff and I are married, we are building a culture. The word culture actually carries with it some significance. Here's a definition for us. Culture is how we do things. Culture is what we value, it's how we behave. Culture talks about our non-negotiables. Culture is something that is spoken and unspoken in our families and in our homes because sometimes we state it and we clarify it and we talk about it. This is so that everybody understands. But there are times where we don't talk about it at all and we just assume that everybody knows and that everybody's going to do what is assumed in our homes. And again, your family has a culture and my family has a culture. There is a way in which you do things and in which I do things. And maybe you're aware of it. Maybe you've talked about it with your husband or your wife, with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, with your kids, with your family. Or maybe you're not aware of it. Maybe it's unspoken, but here's the thing that I want you to know. You are creating it, and you're building it, and you're moving it forward whether you are intentional about it or not. Now here's why this culture conversation is so important for us today at Active. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about honor and how honor is the way forward in our family. Like, if we're going to build a better future for our family, we need to do this all together now. And honor is the way that we build a better future. And we've been talking about how honor actually shapes and influences all of our relationships. Here's the definition we've been running with. Honor is the recognition of value, contribution, and importance. In Romans, a letter that Paul writes to Christians in Rome, he put it this way, that we are to be devoted to one another in love, that we are to honor one another above ourselves, above yourself, above myself. Our conviction and Paul's conviction is that honor is how love is expressed in our family. Like if we want to love each other, honor is the expression of that love. And so the last few weeks, we've been talking about how we can be really thoughtful and really intentional and maybe even strategic in how we honor each other. We talked about honor in relationship, honor in marriage, honor from a parent to a child, from a child to a parent, which brings us to today. And I just want to give you a warning. This is an important warning for every family. And here's the warning that the culture that you have created and are building, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that culture will always win. Now, Peter Drucker is a management consultant and a writer who is a leading expert on creating and building culture. And he's studied organizations and businesses and even families. And his conviction is that everybody is creating and building a culture. And there was one thing in his study, in his interactions with people, no matter the dynamic, especially in family, 
there was one thing that he realized was the same for everybody. And it was this, that the culture you're building will eat your strategy for breakfast. And here's what he means by that, that you can strategize and be intentional all you want, but your culture will always show up. Like in our families, we can strategize to give and receive honor, but our culture, if it doesn't value honor, our culture will eat honor for breakfast. This is why you and I and our families can't just plan to be honorable. Can't just talk about being honorable. Honor must be something we value in our family if we're going to create a healthy family culture. Like this is the thing that we have to commit to. We cannot negotiate this. And if we do value honor, we will tell a better family story. Drucker goes on and he writes about what happens in organizations and businesses when the culture is unhealthy. He writes that people don't just quit on companies or quit on leaders. Most people quit on culture. Maybe that's why you've been so frustrated with your spouse. Maybe that's why you've been so frustrated with your significant other. Maybe that's why you don't look forward to coming home. Because it's not just about them, but it's about all of you and the culture that you've built. And you're not sure exactly why you're frustrated or why you're upset or why it's irritating or why it's not working. But maybe today you realized maybe the culture that we're building is actually really unhealthy. And that's why I'm really frustrated or that's why they're really upset. So let's change that narrative today. Let's build a better family culture today. I want to take you to some words that Jesus shared. And these words are powerful and they're honest and they're convicting and they come right at you. Like, I like these words because it's Jesus saying, here's the best way forward. Here's the command from the heart of God. And what he says today will actually prevent family drama. What he says today will actually help us to build healthy and holy relationships in our families. And here's the the best part. It'll actually benefit your business relationships and it'll benefit your friendships as well. So I want to take you through what Jesus actually has to say about culture. And so we got to go backwards before we can move forward. So I want to walk you through what Jesus said. I want to talk it through. And then we'll talk about how this impacts our family and the culture that we're building. So if you have a Bible with you or the Bible app on your phone, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew's letter in the New Testament of the Bible, Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 21. And Matthew's writing down these words of Jesus. And here's what Jesus has to say. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago that you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Like that's strong words, Jesus, right? He's coming at us in this verse, and I love it because he wants us to have an honorable culture. He wants us to honor each other. He wants us to love our families because that's what followers of Jesus do. And what he talks about here, can you relate to? Like, doesn't it feel like sometimes our families are just filled with anger and threats? Maybe you have a question like, wait a second. He starts with, you've heard it said that murder is bad and you're going to face judgment. But then Jesus has that actually, let me tell you where murder starts from, in the heart with your anger. And you're like, whoa, 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 murder and anger, there's a, there's a distance there. And Jesus would agree with you. There is a distance there. But doesn't murder always start with some sort of anger? Doesn't brokenness always start with some sort of emotion that isn't healthy? And doesn't our anger often kill off trust in our relationships? What Jesus is pointing out here is that your anger can be experienced like a death in a relationship. And doesn't that represent a lot of families? Maybe if you're honest, it represents your family. 
represents my family? Anger's easy to fall into, isn't it? I think that's why Jesus comes so hard with this conversation about anger. And I love the example he uses here. He, he gives us a word in their language because he's speaking to that audience. And so maybe we don't quite understand what he's saying here, but this word actually helps us to understand the depth of what Jesus wants us to know. The word he shares here is hraka. Hraka is a word that's defined this way. To feel disregard for someone or to believe that they are against you. Now, remember, these are Jewish people who spoke the Hebrew language, and this word actually represents the Hebrew language in a very significant way. Because when you say this word, you say it and it stirs up saliva in your mouth. Say it with me. It's chraka, chraka, right? Like, and now all of a sudden you have all of this saliva in your mouth. But here's why Jesus uses that word. Because you saying it actually is a reflection of what's in your heart and what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. And because this stirs up saliva, people would use this word as a way of communicating that I'm about to, and I don't mean to be gross on with you today, but like I'm about to spit on you. Like I'm about to spit on you because I'm disregarding you. You and I both know that if you are going to spit on somebody, it's not because you're honoring them. <laughs> it's not because you love them, right? If you're going to spit on somebody, it's because you're disregarding them. You don't care about them. And that's what Jesus is saying here is that the anger that usually stirs up in our hearts can lead us to a place where we feel haka towards those around us, especially in our family. But what I love about Jesus is he doesn't just let it sit and then move on. He actually gives us a way forward. In verse 23, Matthew writes this, therefore, in light of what Jesus just said, Jesus goes, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and right there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you or you have something against them, listen to his instruction. Leave your gift right there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them and then come back and offer your gift. This is why we believe that what Jesus is talking about is he's talking about our heart. He's talking about what's going on inside of us before it actually overflows outside of us. Because Jesus is saying, hey, when you're in the middle of like worship, you're in the middle of church, and you're lifting your hands, you're taking notes, you're engaging in the message, you're engaging in the community, you're talking with God, praying with God, having communion with God. If in that moment, you realize that there is some sort of anger that's stirring up in you or there is anger that they have stirred up inside of them and you're aware of it, Jesus actually says, you should go and have a conversation with him. His specific words are powerful. Leave your gift there at the front of the altar and go and be reconciled with them and then come back and offer your gift. Jesus says it's better to leave a church service in the middle of the service to go and be godly, to go and be good, to go and be like Jesus, to follow Jesus and to bring reconciliation rather than just stand and pretend that everything's okay. Like when you and I are angry with those around us, especially in our family, we see it very different, right? We go, well, you know, God and I are good, so it's all good. But Jesus actually says, no, it's very different. That our peace with God is expressed in our peaceful relationships with others. Here's how Paul wrote it in Romans. He said, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is why Jesus says, go and be reconciled. Don't assume that you and God are good if you and your family member are not. Because if God is at work in you, you're gonna do whatever you can as far as it depends upon you to reconcile with them. That doesn't mean it's gonna be fixed or solved. It doesn't mean you have to fix it or solve it. It just means that you are open in your heart to asking the question, what does love require of me? What does honor require of me? This is, this is so good and so essential for our relationships 
with our families as we follow Jesus. And here's why. Because typically when we're angry, what do we do? We don't go to them. You know what we go to? We go to someone who knows them and we talk about them with that someone that knows them, don't we? We do this in relationship. We do this in friendship. We do this in our families. We don't go directly to them. And and you know what we do when we go to this other person? We say things like, can you believe what they said to me? Can you believe how they treated me? Can I just call time out for a second? I am over having a conversation with someone who has had a conversation with someone about me and about how they haven't come to me, they went to someone else. Are you with me? Are you done having conversations with someone that is not part of the issue or not part of the problem? Or maybe you're not even aware of the issue or the problem, but someone comes and says, yeah, they were really upset with you. And you're like, well, how come they didn't talk to me? I I feel like I'm a nice guy, right? I feel like I'm a compassionate guy. Maybe you felt the same way, especially in the family. Wait, what? My son or my daughter, they they were upset with me? My wife or my husband, they were mad at me? What what happened? Aren't you just over that? Because I'm over that. And listen, that's not just like a teenage high school thing. Like maybe you've said, I'm over the high school drama. Listen, there are adults that practice what high schoolers and junior hires get blamed for. The truth is, We do this all the time. And the scriptures are very clear about what we should do. In fact, here's what Paul writes in this letter called Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, he says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Now, acts of the flesh is a really fancy way of saying, it's obvious when it's not of God. It's obvious when the Spirit of God is not leading somebody. And then he gives a list, and a part of that list are these three words. Discord dissensions, and factions. Now, these are strong, strong words in Galatians. Strong words from Paul. Here's what they mean. Discord is a lack of harmony. Harmony is when things are working together. Harmony are when when hands clasp together. And discord does whatever it can to disrupt harmony. You ever heard like a great orchestra? And then maybe somebody like hit a wrong note or somebody wasn't following the orchestra leader and you could tell like it was, it was just a bit, not, not so much maybe for like the, the regular person, but maybe you're musically inclined. You could tell like they're just a bit behind the beat. That's lacking harmony. Discord tries to stir that up. And then discord leads to dissensions. Dissensions is bitter disagreement, not just disagreement. But bitter disagreement. It's raka disagreement. I am so mad at you for taking an opposite position that I'm now going to attack your dignity and your humanity. I may not say that out loud and I may not feel that out loud and I may not express that out loud, but it's certainly something that's in my heart. That's what dissensions does. It says, I can't believe you disagree with me. And so I'm coming at you. And dissensions lead to factions. Us versus them. How you vote versus how I vote. How you see the world versus how I see the world. And suddenly, it's all about the topics we're talking about instead of the person that we're interacting with. And this is how a lot of families can behave, right? This is why Jesus talks about it and why Paul talks about it. And it's why Jesus goes, hey, I got a solution. Son of God in the flesh here for you humble servant, here's what you should do. You know what you should do? You need to go and be reconciled with them. Like when you talk about it, you should talk about it with them. When they make you angry, you should tell them that they have made you angry. When they hurt you, you should share why it hurt. Because you can't solve the problem with the one who hurts you if you don't talk to them first, right? That's what honor does. Honor is choosing to talk to the one who hurts you about how they hurt you. Paul actually teases this out for us. Like Jesus says, go and be reconciled. And we're like, all right, what does that mean? (laughs) Like help help us out here. Paul actually teases that out. He takes these words, drops them into real life. Galatians 6.1, he says, brothers and sisters. And I love that he says brothers and sisters. 
He's talking to the men and women of faith, men and women who are part of the church, but we're talking about family. And so this, this is so appropriate. These words are so appropriate for us. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, they're missing the mark. They're not doing what love requires. They have not honored you. They have not honored God. There is dishonor in the family. You who live by the Spirit should restore that person aggressively, right? Actually, that's not what it says at all. It says, you who are filled with the Spirit of God should restore that person with all of the truth that you have, right? No, it's not what it says. It says, you who are filled with the Spirit of the living God who raised Jesus from the dead should go to that person and restore them gently, And here's why our approach should be gentle. Paul says, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. We go with gentleness because we have an awareness that the roles could easily be reversed, right? And if we're on the other side, wouldn't want we, wouldn't want them, we would want them, that's what I'm trying to say. We would want them to approach us with gentleness, right? Not aggressiveness, not throwing facts and figures in our face, but we would want them to meet us in our humanity, to meet us in that space, because we would long for reconciliation, right? That's, that's the honorable way forward. And when you're honorable, you, you, have a, you have a heart-to-heart conversation. Heart-to-heart conversations are always better than head-to-head conversations, right? Here's how you know if it's a heart-to-heart or a head-to-head. Answer this question. What am I willing to lay down? so that we can be reconciled. If you're unwilling to lay down anything, guess what? Head to head, gonna bump heads, gonna come at each other, like two rhinos running after each other. Somebody's gonna get hurt and brokenness is gonna take place. But it's a heart to heart conversation if you are willing to lay down being right so that you can be reconciled. Now, I told you we needed to walk through some words of Jesus and and walk through some words of Paul because it it leads us somewhere when we're talking about the culture of our home. Here's why all of what Jesus and Paul talk about is so important to us, that we can actually, when we commit to actually having a conversation with those in our families, when we commit to going to that person, here's what it does for us. It gives us permission to never assume, to never assume their motives, to never assume their intentions, to never assume that Maybe they really feel this way about us, how we've heard or how they treated us in that moment. And the reason why it gives us permission to never assume is because we're talking. And when you talk, you get clarity with them instead of talking to somebody else about them. This is huge. Anytime there's a problem, you know that you can go to them and talk to them because that's what honorable people do. And here's why this is so important for our families. And here's how our culture of honor can actually be created and built in our families. Here's how you can value honor. There will be a time, if it hasn't happened yet, it's coming, where someone in your family, husband, wife, brother, sister, sibling, parent, child, whoever it is, someone in your family is going to do something or say something that is so foreign to what you know about them. Right, And there's going to be a gap between what they've said or what they've done versus what you know about them. You're going to have a decision to make. And the decision is this. You get to fill that gap with one of two things. You can assume the worst or you can believe the best. You can assume the worst about them or you can believe the best about them. Here's here's what that sounds like in real time. Assuming the worst is, wow, that hurt. They're a jerk. And I'm not going to speak to them until they apologize to me. That's assuming the worst. Believing the best is, wow, that hurt. And yeah, that was kind of jerky. You know what I'm gonna do? There there must be something going on inside of them. So when things calm down within the next half hour or so, I'm, I'm gonna have a conversation with them and I'm gonna get clarity about what's happening in their life. You're believing the best about them because you're choosing to honor them. And you know that you can honor them because you've had a conversation before and you're gonna have a conversation after. You're gonna get clarity. You don't have to assume that you know what's going on inside of their heart and in their mind. You're gonna know because you talk about it. You're gonna know because you're going to talk about it. 
When there's a gap between what they've said or what they've done and who they are and what you know about them, you get to decide what you're gonna fill that gap with. And honor and a culture of honor always believes the best. Now, here's, here's why this is so good for me and for you and for our families. This changes the culture of our home because now we don't have to assume that maybe there's something going on or maybe they really don't like me or maybe they want a divorce or maybe they don't want to listen to maybe they just want to be rebellious or maybe they don't want to go to church or maybe they don't love you. Mm -hmm. We don't have to even go there because we're committed to talking about it. You know, like Jesus said, and maybe we don't talk about it soon enough. And so Jesus says, go and reconcile. It's why we can fill the gap with believing the best because there's gonna be clarity and there's gonna be love and there's gonna be truth. There's gonna be honor. Do you see why if you have an unhealthy culture, why that will eat honor? It'll eat your strategy for breakfast? Because if your culture doesn't value honor, you won't talk, you'll just assume. And then you'll grow further and further apart. And then you'll go, well, I don't, I don't know what happened. Well, what happened is you negotiated on her. It's why Jesus says, if you have this sense in your heart that there's something up and you're in the middle of a church service, <laughs> leave your gift there. Go and reconcile and then come back and offer your gift because that's what followers of Jesus do. They live with honor and honor chooses to believe the best and talk out the rest. Followers of Jesus, they don't assume Followers of Jesus, they live in what is true. Each family has a culture. Yours does, my, mine does. Tiff and I are building a culture. We had a culture from the family that we came from. We've taken the good of that culture and we've left out the bad of that culture. All families have a culture that we're creating and we're either building it or we're allowing it. So tell me about your culture. And you can actually answer this question to help you know if your culture is about honor, if your culture is healthy. What do you fill the gap with? Do you assume the worst? Or do you believe the best? Do you talk it through? Or do you talk to them about what they've done to you? If your culture is healthy, if your culture is holy, if honor is what you value because you're a follower of Jesus, then you're always gonna fill that gap with believing the best, and then you're gonna talk out the rest. This is what honor does. And when you talk it through, you get to what's true. Just like Jesus said, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And, and I would even add this, and the truth will allow you to honor them. So let's honor each other and fill the gap by believing the best because we're gonna talk out the rest. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, may we be people, husbands, wives, sons, daughters. May we be parents, kids who live with honor that we would fill the gap between what we heard, what we saw versus what we know, and we would fill that gap believing the best about our family member and then making a commitment to talk out the rest because that's what honor does. May we honor them because you have honored us. May we honor them because we follow Jesus and we wanna honor Jesus in the way that we speak and live in this world. May we honor them because that is the way of the kingdom of God. May we honor them because that is the currency in the kingdom of God. And may we be people of honor and may we live lives that is irresistible because Jesus is irresistible. And we pray all of these things in his name and together we say amen and amen and amen. I don't know how he does it every week, but Pastor Mike delivers a great message each week. 
and we're so thankful for that. And I love the idea of shaping our culture, wherever that culture may be, maybe at work, at home, um, through your friend's circle, through honor. What a great idea, what a great thought that we can learn through Jesus and through the Bible. Thank you for delivering that message for us, Pastor Mike. Right now, I wanna take some time to say thank you to the people that give to the mission and vision of Active and to the people who have been on this journey of generosity because you allow us to have baptisms happen. You allow us to do dollar club moments and you allow us to do things like kids blitz where hundreds of kids come and enjoy the best week of their summer and for free. You guys do that all. You guys make all of that happen. So thank you. And I want to invite you guys to give this morning, especially if maybe this is the first time you give today. I would encourage you to give something, whatever it may be, a dollar, whatever is comfortable for you, because we are doing something awesome here at Active and we want you to be a part of it. Part of it. We want you to be a part of changing people's lives, families' lives. And we thank you so much for being on this journey. There's two ways to do that here. You can go to activechurches.com, hit the give button and set up giving there, or you can text the number on the screen and text any amount that you would like to give. Thank you guys so much for joining us for Active at Home today. We love you guys. We hope to see you next week, and we would love to see you on campus too. We have services at 9 and 1045 every single Sunday. We have a place for your kiddos so if you have kids. Come join us and be a part of what we're doing here at Active. We love you guys. See you next week.